Well, good morning. Uh, like Steve said, my name is uh, Scott. I'm so happy to be here sharing with you uh, this morning. Hey, just really quickly, um, if you did not get one of these as you came in this morning, if you could just raise your hand, I'll have Ryan get one into your hand really quick. I think we uh, covered everybody, but uh, this is part of uh, the message today. Uh, it's your next step today, so if you don't have one of these, just go ahead and raise your hand, and Ryan will be around. So welcome this morning. We are so glad that you chose to uh, join us here this morning on a Sunday. I know there could have been a lot of other things you're, you, you had, uh, could have been doing, a lot of things on your plate, but you chose to be here and worshiping with this community, and, and we're glad. Like Steve said, we're in our series called Snapshot, and we're looking at um, just pictures. You know, they say a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, we've been looking at just snapshots of of people and their encounters with Jesus. And in those, we've seen that in that moment of these individuals, their life takes a whole new trajectory. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to do the same thing. But before we get started, I want to share a story with you of a time that I had to go big, really big. And if I've shared this story before, you just have to humor me like you do with your grandpa who repeats his stories over. Because I'm that guy. I'm becoming that guy. I don't know what I share when I share anymore. So um, just humor me, man. Uh, so I, I used to be on a, uh, a staff of a church a while back. And I was in the role of kind of worship arts dude. I don't have any musical abilities. But I, was, I had a creative input on things of how we would um, kind of structure or package our series, come up with hopefully clever metaphors that would help convey the message. Well, we were doing a series on how to live generously, and, and more specifically, making that commitment to return back to God a certain percentage of our income in order to accomplish His work here on earth. And that's a huge step for people. We don't naturally live generously like that. And we thought, you know, Making that commitment feels like jumping out of an airplane. It's scary to some people, and to some people it just doesn't make sense. And so we came up with this idea, said, oh, we'll have our lead pastor go skydiving, and we'll film it, right? And we'll show that on a, on a Sunday morning. Well, he wasn't too thrilled with that idea. So, so I started the typical man thing. I started talking trash, talking smack, questioning his manhood, right? I said, well, you know, so, and so what does he do? He returned, he said, well, you have to go too. I'm like, all right, whatever, whatever, you know. And so I, I taunted, we taunted each other for a while. Well, it was my job to research a place where we could um, go skydiving. And, and in that process, I found out that there was a weight limit. Go figure, he was... A few pounds over the weight limit, and I was way over the weight limit, and that was my out. That was more, I rode that like nothing, right? You know, I told him, you know, sure, I, I wouldn't wuss out like you, you're trying to do. I'd go, but I'm way over the weight limit. They won't let me go. And so I they spend the next couple of weeks with him, and, and I'd go to lunch with him, make sure he got the salad. I said, don't, you don't, you, you better lose those, those pounds, because you don't try to get out of this, you're... You're doing that. Well, long story short, we end up near Canyon City down, uh, down south because it was the only place that would take us. And um, we're sitting there on the, on the airfield. And uh, one of the jump guys, he was the, he's what you call the jump master. He was kind of like the guy in charge. He, he comes up to me and he said, hey, uh, hey, are you going? I'm like, no, oh, oh, too heavy, too heavy, Right? He goes, how much do you weigh? I'm like, oh, at least 240. Oh, yeah, tipping the scales at, at 240. And, and, he, and he does this. He, he goes, I'll take you. <laughs> A few whispered expletives left my mouth. <laughs> Here's a shot of me uh, getting dressed. Um, uh, okay, okay, seriously, I was trying to act cool, you, look at that, that's, that's giving everything away, I was scared to death about doing, because I didn't know, what. You know, I, I didn't come into it expecting, and the next shot is some guys, um, 
It may look like they're trying to comfort me. They're not. They're taking advantage of the situation. They're talking trash. They're like, hey, if your chute doesn't open, can I have your car? I'm like, oh, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, and at this point, I knew there was just simply no way I was going to get out of it after all of the smack talk I, I put on. Because if the lead pastor found out that I had an opportunity to go and I didn't take it, I would never live that down. Right? So I, I, my mouth got me in trouble. I had to go. Well, I went, and luckily, uh, the chute opened. Woo-hoo! Man. Wow. I, my heart's pounding just because of the memories. It was crazy. And you can see in the next picture, that's a happy dude right there. Happy dude. Man, that's a time that I just went big. Well, this morning, I want to share a snapshot with you of a lady who went big. She, she, she took a huge risk, and she reached out in faith. And to start, we need to know what these are called, these little tassels, and why it plays an important part of this woman's interaction with Jesus. To understand this whole get-up right here, and especially these little tassels, we have to go all the way back to Numbers chapter 15. A guy had broken one of the commandments, and he suffered some pretty gnarly circumstances. And we see God's response. God says this. Verse 37, Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Throughout the generations to come, You must make tassels for the hem of your clothing and attach them with a blue cord. When you see the tassels, you will remember and obey all the commands of the Lord instead of following your own desires and defiling yourselves as you are prone to do. Who can identify with that? Verse 40, the tassels will help you remember that you must obey all the commands of all my commands, and be holy to your God. So these were a command of God. We even see it in Deuteronomy. Chapter 22, verse 12, it says, uh, God is saying, you must put four tassels on the hem of the cloak with which you cover yourselves, on the front, back, and side. So these little tassels are what we're talking about this morning. And it's hard for us to grasp just what this meant to the Jewish people. Because some of us really like our clothing. I know some of you ladies in your Gucci bags, like you think they're sacred, they're not, right? The, to the Jewish, ancient, ancient Hebrew people, some of their clothing were very significant, very sacred to them. This, and specifically these, being one of them. This whole cloth here is called, uh, it's a prayer shawl or a, a tallit. And these little things are called tzitzit. Like a tzitzit fly, they're called tzitzit, these little tassels. And you'll notice on there, I don't know if you can see it from there, but there's um, four little bands of windings, and they're knotted in just a certain way. And, and the, uh, the, knot, the, the windings go 7, 8, 11, and 13. Long story short, this little tassel was a, a visual reminder of the phrase, God is one. God is one. There's even significance in the blue thread, and it's crazy to get into the history of it. It's really fascinating. We don't have time to do that this morning. But over these centuries, these, these cloaks or these tallits, they took on different forms. In the time of Moses, they may have looked like this, somewhat of a skirt-looking thing. Um, but you'll notice there's the tassels, and there's the tallit. On there, the tassels, and, and, and it maybe represented more uh, a reflection of more of the, the Egyptian style of dress. And over the centuries, they would change in form. They, later on, they'd become a much larger garment, resembling maybe a poncho uh, or a longer nightshirt. But again, you see the, the tassels on there on each of the four corners. In the Hebrews, they would, uh, the Jewish people, they would wear their undergarment, called their tunic, and over it, their tallit, or their cloak. And that's where we get the whole, when, when Jesus says, somebody asks for your, uh, your tunic, he says, give them your cloak also, your tallit, your outer garment, which was um, very embarrassing to be caught in public without it. 
But he says, that's how much you should love people. And today we see Orthodox Jews. You see the little tassels or the, the tzitzit coming out. Um, or you see uh, uh, another, um, uh, just a typical prayer shawl, like here this morning. Well, it, it's kind of safe to say that this is not what Jesus wore, right? Um, but what we do know is that whatever garment he had, whatever style it was, he had tassels on each of the four corners of his garment. Well, why is this important? It's important because Jesus fulfilled every single requirement of the Old Testament perfectly. And so he followed God's command to have tassels on the four corners of his garment, reminding him of God's life-giving decrees. That's why he wore them. But there's more to the story. You see, in the Old Testament, there's predictions or prophecies that, that look forward to to the coming Messiah, or, or, or a, another name for Messiah is like Savior, the Savior of Israel. Someone's going to come and save Israel, and Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. In fact, he, uh, we now know he is the Savior of not just Israel, but the whole world. Well, he fulfilled those 300 prophecies perfectly, all the written prophecies. But more than that, it becomes even more convincing that there were some oral prophecy, some oral traditions, and Jesus fulfilled each one of those perfectly, perfectly. And I want to draw your attention to this one in particular this morning. It comes out of a book called Malachi, or if you're Italian, Malachi. That's such an old joke. I still, I'm a grandpa, right? I, I want to be a grandpa. I'm practicing grandpa jokes. Uh, it comes out of Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. Watch this. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, and that's S-U-N, that's spelled correctly, but that's another name for the coming Messiah or Savior. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Did you know that the original word for these tassels can also be translated as wings? So there's this oral tradition, there's this expectation that the coming Messiah will have healing in the tassels of his tallit. So why is that important to our story this morning of this interaction this woman had with Jesus? Well, that's the, the quick and dirty kind of overview history of where this, this comes from. So let's get into our story, our snapshot. This morning, picture, imagine if you will, a... Uh, uh, a very uh, vibrant, young Jewish teenager some 2,000 years ago. Um, she had just gotten married to a nice young man, and she dreams of having children and even grandchildren. And then, let's say, I don't know, uh, uh, the Lord blesses her, God blesses her with twins. And then on, her, on the, the twins' second birthday, something drastic happens, something horrible happens, tragedy invades her home. She wakes up one morning and her bed is saturated with blood, her blood. And it, it was way beyond just her typical menstruation. She was sticking with fears, like, what's going on? What's happening? And your heart's pounding and she's scared. This isn't normal. And her, her husband immediately goes outside. And I know that sounds kind of cold. But you see, she was considered unclean according to the ceremonial laws and traditions of her people found in the book of Leviticus. And the bed was now considered the same. And if her husband had touched her, he would be considered unclean also. So he went outside. See, under Mosaic law, uh, women who had an issue of blood, whether it's a menstrual or postpartum bleeding, they were considered unclean and they were put apart or they were separated for seven days from everyone else. And during this time, anything that this, uh, a lady would sit on or, or touch would be considered unclean. If anybody else touched those things, they would be considered unclean and, and they would have to wash their clothes and bathe in water and to become clean again. And I know this seems excessive, but let's not be judgmental about someone else's culture or heritage. And if you look, actually... For a guy who had an issue of blood or was considered unclean, the requirements were even 
much more strict. But just imagine the fear she's experiencing. This, this wasn't normal. This wasn't, it wasn't even her, her normal cycle time. There was something wrong. Well, her and her husband, they, they make arrangements to have her separated as they normally did during her menstruation. However, after a week, her bleeding doesn't stop. It just keeps going. And weeks go by and then months. And all this time, her and her husband are seeking help from doctors, from 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 priests, and they're, they're kind of getting extremely desperate or, or just wanting help, and, and no help comes. Nothing fixes the problem. Just imagine that. During this whole time, she can't even hug and kiss her own children. The best she can do is, is wave at them from a distance, holding back tears as the just the ache of her heart is burning as only a mother's can. Imagine the, the pain, the sorrow. And as months turn into more than a year, her, her husband divorces her as she's deemed unfit for cohabitation, not, uh, not able to care for her own children. It's likely she was suffering from a condition called menorrhea. Imagine the pain she's going through. She becomes isolated, lonely, depressed. She hardly went out, if at all. You know, perhaps maybe a family member would come by and drop off supplies and food at her door. Maybe it's her sister who, who stands just outside the window and they... They talk through the window and they catch up on family, her children, what's happening in the community. She spends years seeking treatment to no avail. We don't have too many details about her encounter with Jesus, but we can imagine that her, her condition was extremely grim. One author writes this. Frail, emaciated, anemic, she is a shell of her former vivacious, exuberant self. Her youthful beauty has dissolved into a haggard look of weakness. Her ashen face is punctuated by thin lips and the sullen eyes of rejection. Her condition is physically weak. Her psychologically and emotional condition is, is, is depressed. If she, listen, if she ever had the misfortune of actually going out in public and, and, and possibly running into someone on the street, do you know what she was required to do? She was required to say, to forewarn them, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine the humiliation that she suffered? She was an outcast. So imagine when she hears from her sister that, that Jesus is on the other side of the village. I mean, she'd heard the rumors of how he, he you know, he, he'd fed people, like crazy miracle kind of stuff. That, that he had even healed people. He healed those people who were blind. He cast out demons. There's even a rumor that, that he had command over the weather, over the storms. Imagine that. And then a desperate hope starts building and rising in her. And she's like, oh, oh, if only I could touch the wings of his talit. Right? She, and so she, she gets dressed really quickly, just leaving a slip for just her eyes. And she, she covers herself and she puts her head down, trying to make herself invisible. And she heads out to the other side of the village. And as she comes up on the, the mob that was surrounding Jesus, she just had one thought, one thought in her mind. If I can only touch the wings of his talit. And so she's jostled and, and pushed as her frail frame maneuvers closer to Jesus. 
And then all of a sudden she's gripped with fear. The reality of what she's doing crushes her. It, it paralyzes her emotion. She knows that every person she's brushing up against is now unclean. They can't even go into the temple. They would have to be separated. She, knew, she knows that, that if she's ever discovered in this, that they, they recognize her, that they, they, would, they would surely beat her. Or worse, and what was she doing trying to touch a prominent rabbi and make him unclean? She had made a mistake. She had made a grave mistake by coming. But then tears, they well up in her eyes and she utters an audible and loud, No! If only I can touch the wings of his talit. And she gets within just a, a few feet of Jesus. She's jostled and pushed, and she stumbles and falls. And through the forest of people, she sees his tassels. And the sound of the crowd just fades away as her heart's pounding and thundering in her ears. And then she reaches out in faith. There's a doctor by the name of Luke who recorded a historic event for us. This snapshot of this incredible step of faith that this woman displayed. And it comes in a book called Luke. It's a historic biography of the life of Jesus. And Luke records this in chapter 8. On his return, Jesus was welcomed by a crowd. They were all expecting him. A man came up, Jairus by name. He was the president of the meeting place. He fell at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his home because his 12-year-old daughter, his only child, was dying. Jesus went with him making his way through the pushing and jostling crowd. In the crowd that day, there was a woman, our woman, who was 12 years afflicted with hemorrhages. She had spent every penny she had on doctors, but not one had been able to help her. She slipped in from behind and touched the edge or the tzitzit, the tassels on the edge of his robe. And at that very moment, her hemorrhaging stopped. And Jesus said, oh, who touched me? And I don't think that Jesus uh, asked that question in an in accusatory, accusatory kind of tone. Because Jesus was always just fascinated. He was kind of almost giddy when he saw it faith on display. So I'm like, he's like, whoa, whoo, someone just touched me. And he's like, oh, it's going to be a day. And he gets excited when no one stepped forward, Peter said, and I love Peter because Peter's this kind of simple, let's just keep it simple, blue-collar kind of guy. And Jesus, I think, frustrates him every once in a while. There's even a time when we're like, they're, the disciples are like, Jesus, would you stop with the riddles? Okay, just talk to us plainly. I think this is one of those times where Peter's like, someone touched you. Uh, Duh, we're in this crowd, dude. What's wrong with you? Why are you acting like such a prima donna right now? All right, so I think, I think that, and I, I project onto Peter maybe a lot of my own, my own personality, but Peter's like, Master, uh, we've got crowds of people on our hands. Dozens have touched you. But Jesus insisted, ah, someone touched me. <laughs> I felt power discharging from me. And I wonder, I wonder if Peter, or I wonder if Jesus chose not to know who it was, or, or maybe he was calling her forth publicly. I think it was the latter. I think right in front of everyone, he wanted to elevate her status. He wanted to restore her publicly. I think 
that right in front of all those people who had shunned her for so many years, he wanted to let them know that she was the most important person on the planet to him at that very moment. I think that's why he was asking. But she didn't know that. Right? Verse 47. When the woman realized that she couldn't remain hidden, she, she knelt trembling. In front of all the people, she, she blurted out her story, why she touched him, and how at the same moment she was healed. And then Jesus, watch how gentle he is with her, because he uses a term of endearment, daughter, and immediately calms her fears. And that's the way Jesus is with us. He's gentle when we come to him. Verse 48, Jesus said, daughter, <laughs> Like, he's like, woo, daughter, you took a risk trusting me. And now you, you're healed and whole. Live well. Live blessed. She reached out in faith and took a risk. She was healed and made whole. And not just physically. You got to get beyond that. She was restored to her community. She was restored to her family. She was restored to human touch. Imagine 12 years not feeling the touch of another person. You would die inside. She was once again restored. She now belonged, no longer an outcast, all because she reached out in faith. Faith, what an incredible snapshot of a woman's interaction with Jesus. What about our interactions with Jesus? What about your interaction with Jesus? You know, this past Wednesday night we had Accelerate Group, which is our small group, we kind of meet in people's homes and and maybe we grub, eat, we spend time encouraging each other, praying for each other, uh, but we spend time discussing um, what was preached on the previous Sunday, and, and Steve led our discussion, and he asked that question, what limits you? And it was a very poignant question, really great, great conversation, and in the middle of it, of everybody sharing, I noticed there was a common element, and it was the common element of fear, fear of failure, Fear of rejection, fear of not being included, fear of not belonging, fear of feeling like an outcast, fear of what others might think. And, and as we were all sharing, this woman's action just burst into my mind. She reached out in faith, risked. She pushed past our, her fear to trust. So what is it this morning that your, your, your Father in heaven wants you to reach out in faith for, to take a risk? Is it, I don't know, is it a, a new career? Maybe taking on a new job at the company you're already at? Is it telling a, a stranger or family member or a friend about Jesus. Reach out in faith. Take a risk. Maybe it's serving the, the church, the people around you in, in a new way. Maybe taking on a position of, of leadership. Maybe it's owning your own actions and asking someone for forgiveness. Or the opposite extending forgiveness to someone else in your own heart. Man, reach out in faith. Take a risk. I don't know, maybe it's reconnecting with an estranged family member or a friend. Maybe it's uh, beginning school again. Oof. Reach out in faith. Take a risk. What is it that your Father in Heaven is calling you to do? Maybe it's ending a bad relationship. Maybe, ha, 
Maybe it's starting a new relationship. Maybe it's starting a brand new relationship with Jesus. Reach out in faith. Take a risk. You know, perhaps it's, it's this last one I just mentioned, starting a new relationship with Jesus. Well, there's something important that, that I want you to know. I don't think Jesus used this, this uh, term daughter just to be endearing. It was part of it. But you see, he knew what lay in front of her. He knew that she would have this restored relationship with her heavenly father through him. You see, the the gospel or the the good news is not that we get to invite Jesus into our life. That's not it. The good news is that Jesus invites us into his life to, to have his relationship with his father. Why is that important? Because way back when our prototype parents, Adam and Eve, they broke relationship. And you and I, we continue in that, that brokenness. And Jesus took all of our sin, all of our brokenness, and he destroyed it on the cross. And in turn, he gives us life, like authentic life through his resurrection. He gives us eternal life. Do you know what eternal life is? Jesus, he defines it for us in his prayer in John chapter 17. And he says, and this father is eternal life, that they may know you, relationship, and Jesus Christ whom you you have sent. We often think eternal life is heaven someday. No, no, no. It's now. And it's relationship. It's relationship with our Father in heaven. That's eternal life. So here's what I want you to do. Every one of you uh, uh, was given this piece of paper when you came in. And and if you're online, um, you can just grab a piece of paper and something to write with right now. Here's what I want you to do. We're going to take just a few moments. And I believe that there are people in here that God has something for you. It's right out in front. And you're scared. You're full of fear. And I get that. I experienced that, man. I get that. But what is it that your heavenly Father wants you to reach out in faith for? I'm going to just take a couple of minutes, and I want you to just write it right in there. This is your snapshot, so to speak. What is it? And I just want you to write it right in that space. We're going to take about a minute and 30 seconds. And I want to pray for those steps of faith and, and pray for us. Let's just take uh, about 30, 30 seconds and write that in. And band, I also, if you want, I gave you stuff to write. If you want to write that. write down your action what God is asking you to do not what you want him to do he's asking you to take a step of faith what is that action write that in all right when you're done just just hold that uh, I don't know you want to hold it in your hand maybe hold it on your heart and I, I seriously want to take, take this Seriously, I think God is is creating a moment we can have our own snapshot. And maybe today, your life takes on a whole new trajectory. So join me, in, and I'm just going to pray for you guys, pray for these steps. Father, thank you, first of all, for being a good father. 
Jesus, thank you for being gentle with us, with us when we come to you. Thank you for accepting us in our brokenness. Telling us it's okay not to be okay. For just loving us. Thank you for that. Father, for those, uh, for those of us who wrote something down and we're scared. There's, there's that fear. It feels like jumping out of us. A plane for crying out loud. Spirit, would you just encourage us in that? Would you give us the, the, the peace to know that you're with us in everything? Help us to trust in you more. Despite what other people might think or what we think or tell ourselves, you tell us the truth that you've never forsaken us. You'll always be with us. And Father, in these, in these declared steps of faith, it's reaching out in faith, taking a risk. I ask that you just bless the socks off people who just take that action. And Father, for those people who are too scared to take that action, would you just remind them that you're not disappointed in them? You're not wagging your finger at them, but that Spirit, would you just speak to their soul? Just tell them how much you love them. And that it's okay. It's okay. Father, help us step out in courage. Just like the woman who did, who touched the wings of your toy. She took a chance. She took a risk. Thank you for that incredible story and thank you that it was recorded for us in history and we can learn from that, from that and be inspired. Thank you, Lord, for your, for your word, for your revelation, your, your love letter to us that is the Bible. Thank you. We come to you in the mighty, healing name of Jesus, your son. Amen. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your snapshots. I want you to take them home and put them on the fridge or take them to work and put them on your cubicle, tape them to your filing cabinet. And if it's a private thing, just let leave it facing, uh, the back facing out. And every time that you see your snapshot, I want you to take just a quick opportunity and pray to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is God. And say, God, would you give me courage? Would you give me courage to take out, take a step of faith, to reach out in faith, to take a risk? take those home. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to read some the words of the Apostle John, the Apostle Paul. I want us to just let it just wash over us and just sink into us, soak into us. So John, a guy who actually walked with Jesus, hung out with him, was actually kind of his best friend who knew the truth. John said this, to all who believed him, that's Jesus, and accepted him. He gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but from a birth that comes from God. Paul continues this idea. He says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, or Daddy, Father. We are no longer a slave to fear. We are a child of God. Reach out. Take a risk.